Hi everybody, it's Tom Schaller here in Los Angeles. And uh, I wish we could all be there together painting, but uh, it's a new world, isn't it? So here I am at my home studio with uh, Otis. Here he is uh, a couple days ago struggling with social distance, but he sends his love as do I to everybody out there. Um, I'm going to be doing a painting for you today. There's a surprise. Um, but first, I just want to say thanks for everybody tuning in. Thanks to everybody at Fabriano. Uh, of course, most especially Anna for organizing all of this and making this happen in uh, very unexpected, difficult circumstances. So I deeply appreciate it. I think uh, art now more than ever is is an important building block of life as always, but in definitely moving forward, it, it will continue to be more than ever. And we will all get through this together and uh, we'll find new ways of doing what we love and new ways of uh, making a better world. So uh, to that end, what I'm doing today as a demonstration painting is to talk a little bit about uh, what inspires you to paint. Obviously, being able to fly around the world, uh, you find amazing things to paint. But a good painter ought to be able to find uh, a good subject in their own backyard or on their kitchen counter, no matter the circumstance. So I'm sort of gearing what I'm doing today to our new reality in that sense. Because another great source of inspiration for me is and always has been uh, memory, dreams, pure invention. This is a scene. It's not a real place. Well, actually, it is a real place, but it's not a real view of that place. It's a thought about a memory of a, a dedication to that place. This is, uh, I'm calling this end of the day, Venice, California, here where I live. We have all these beautiful little canals mimicking Venice, Italy in, a, in its way with these uh, beautiful houses that back up to the water and many people have these uh, docks. So what I'm doing is uh, sort of a, an invented, made up scene of uh, something like that. So two people sitting on a dock, a couple of boats under a big uh, ficus tree with a uh, tree swing. And um, I'm remembering though always when I design a painting that we're working on a flat sheet of paper. We have only two dimensions, height and width. So whatever I can do to help tell the story, to give the painting the illusion of dimensionality and perspective, three dimensions, uh, I think that's something worth considering and usually all to the good. Lots of ways to get there, lots of tricks and things you can learn, but I think one of the simplest ways is how the painter organizes the values in uh, his or her painting. I break all my paintings down into sort of a choreography of three basic values. The lightest light, the midtones, and the darkest darks. You can arrange those within your painting spatially, foreground, midground, background, almost any way you like. But if you do that, you're gonna get this sense of uh, depth, perspective, um, and dimensionality. In this case, what I, because I want this to look like an um, evening scene, what I'm doing is off the, off the uh, surface of the canal, I want to imply mist coming up, a very hazy sky, a sense of trees, maybe a ghostly uh, neighboring house in the background, all very, um, fuzzy, very indistinct, very impressionistic, to help tell the story of the end of day, but also to get the sense of depth. My lightest light will be the mist, the, the failing light at end of day, glancing off the water. This will be largely untouched paper. My midtones will be the hazy, indistinct, impressionistic background, and also the uh, shadowy, dusky, foreground, the water, reflections. My darkest dark will be this collection of shapes here. This dark silhouetted tree, the uh, dock, 
people standing and sitting on the dock and the boats then on the water. So I hope if I do this well, what you'll, what you'll get is this sense of calm, quiet, and uh, connectivity. The boats connected to the water, the water connected to the docks, the docks connected to the people, the people to the tree, and the tree to the land and the sky beyond. All things orchestrated, working together, and connected. This little sketch uh, represents my working process in that I have these sketchbooks that go everywhere with me. I do hundreds of sketches, some things I see, and other things such as this that I just dream up, I think about, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and do a little idea sketch. I'll develop it. Uh, these are not intended to be really nice drawings. They're intended to be ideas. So even if I'm doing plein air work, I will use these uh, compositional idea value studies as the blueprint, if you will, for designing my actual painting. So moving on to that, just a few minutes ago, I drew this up based on my sketch, which you can see. So uh, the sketch is a bit of a laboratory for my final painting where I can work out ideas, obviously of value, but also of shape of things, composition of elements. So I can adjust as needed or change things up here and there, trying to get a very comfortable composition. I have sort of a, a primary um, horizontal element will be a band of information along the bottom third of the painting and the primary vertical elements secondarily will be uh, a collection of darks and lights in the vertical axis here. The center of interest I intend to be here. Almost always in a painting where your darkest dark meets your lightest light, that's going to be where the eye of the viewer is going to go. So this is where I want to put most of my attention. Any of my detail, there won't be much, but any at all will be in this bullseye area. The rest of the painting, I want purposefully to be allowed to fade into the distance, also to help enhance and tell the story, this quiet, uh, placid end of the day. So this I'll keep off to the side and just refer to it now and then. Obviously I have no reference photos, so that won't be getting in my way. And um, I work my paintings up almost always from the lightest light to the darkest darks. There are some exceptions, of course, but um, almost always. So I'm gonna start in the background with a big wet brush. This is a Asian hockey style brush. Uh, squirrel hair holds loads of water and it's good for these big impressionistic uh, washes. I'm not trying to be at all careful. This is the distance. So what I'm trying to do is just set a tone. Carve away, if you will, a little bit of the, the light of the paper. I'm asked very often how I paint light in my paintings. The answer is I don't. The light is already there. It's there waiting for you on the surface of the unpainted sheet of paper itself. So you start off with a maximum amount of light from the plain white paper. Then you carve away areas of shade, shadow, um, with shapes of tone and value. That's one of the things I suppose I love most about watercolor is that it is that sort of um, subtractive process. It's an inverse of other types of painting media in that you don't add white paint, you take away areas of white to reveal the light that's already there to give the light its identity. I like that challenge. I think it's uh, quite fun and very satisfying when it works, very frustrating when it doesn't, which it almost uh, 
you can count on it never going quite the way you want it, but that's okay. That's part of the joy of watercolor. No matter how much you plan, there are always gonna be things that just don't quite work out. That's why we do it. It's fun. So again, I'm being very impressionistic. I'm working in some um, violets. It's complement of yellows. I always work in complements. Some pale grayed out green and some pale reds. Again, some complements. All of this is just to work on my mid-tones to establish this uh, mid, mid-tone background. I'm gonna wash it out to preserve the white weight here that I need to preserve for the painting. Then I'm gonna do a reverse wash in the foreground, also of mid-tones in a different way. You'll see in a second. Um, but because watercolor is like this, because we don't paint typically the whites, we try to preserve them or work around them or save them it's just a reminder that what is not painted in a watercolor is just as important as what is painted. So um, I know I'm just demoing here today, I'm not really teaching, but I'm just trying to explain to you my thought process and what goes into, uh, what, what goes on inside my little brain as I, uh, as I do these things. So again, I'm trying not to be at all careful. I want the background to look hazy and uh, indistinct. Here, what I'm doing is uh, I did hold an edge around where I might want to imply a little house peeking through the trees in the background. I don't want it to be a focal point and to cause too much attention drawn to itself so I'm misting it with my handy dandy spray gun, which I use a lot. What this does is it encourages tones to run together, but almost more importantly, it'll soften an edge that you don't want to be too hard. What's happening here is I want this sense of mist rising up from the water. So I want uh, pure untouched paper in this band. So I'm mopping up that bead, feathering out the edge. Then I'm gonna hit it again with the uh, spray gun pretty hard just to introduce pure, clean, uh, unpigmented water. And then there we go. So the background, indistinct as it is, washes down into a completely unpainted area of white that I want to maintain throughout the painting. So there is a little identity here where this object may be a house peeking through the trees. Again, I don't want it to uh, be too focal. I don't think it's a bad idea to have a glint of light there to connect some of these others, but I don't want too much. But I also know that this big tree is gonna overhang much of it. So I don't think I, I really need to worry about it too much at all. I'll drop in just little bits of uh, off red, Venetian red there to um, sing off against some of that green in the background. And then I'm gonna drop in a, just a little bit more saturated version of this olive green. It's a serpentine green. I know this tree is going to become less distinct as it comes this way. So this edge of the painting could use a little bit more weight in the background. That should do it. Now, before this dries, although I can re-wet it easily enough, but I don't want an edge here at all. I want this pure white mist to then melt into the foreground. So with the big wet wash brush, I'll start with a, another wash in the, to start to form the water area. 
a little bit more of that green, which will hopefully feel like the reflections of these trees in the background. The water obviously is a little closer up to the um, viewer's point of view, the imaginary viewer. So I can afford to use a little more saturated color, a little more value here in the, uh, the foreground. It's another way to imply depth in your paintings. One is in edges, things that are softer, wet and wet, so-called fuzzy edges, tend to imply something further away, whereas more crisp, harder edges, especially as you're going to see here, will obviously imply something that's a little closer up to you. That's not a rule, because if it were, there are a million exceptions, but it's just sort of uh, a rule of thumb or something to think about. Uh, finished off that wash with a, a bit of deep violet, just to keep it in this uh, shady feeling. Um, as much as I can, I try my best never to paint what I'm looking at or what I see, even if it's an imaginary subject such as this. What I try my best to do as a painter, in fact, I think for me as a painter, it's my job never to paint exactly what I see, what I look at, but rather whatever that thing is, whatever reaction that scene, that person, that place has. So what I'm saying is I try to paint the feeling that my uh, subject inspires in me, and hopefully I can translate that to uh, people who look at my work, to the viewers, so you can begin to uh, have your own reactions. They don't need to be the same as mine. You can make your own stories. I prefer that, actually. But in any case, I try to paint what I feel rather than what I see, and uh, hope that the viewer uh, comes along on that ride with me. So, so far you can see I'm doing okay what I've Try to do, again, I work my paintings up from light to dark. So the lightest light is already there. It's the pure white paper that I've tried to preserve here, bouncing up off the water and behind the people. Then I started on my mid-tones, the background, the foreground. And then I will start on my darkest darks. I try always, as best I can, to work my paintings up all together. That is to say, all at once. I rarely let anything dry and then glaze over it. I can't say never, but I rarely do. So uh, if you paint in that way, you know that you have to sort of um, stage your paintings. I did this background first, then this. Hopefully what that did is gave me enough time that I can start in on my dark, darkest darks, this tree first. Um, and what I did behind will be dry enough that it will hold an edge if I need it to. I don't want it to be fully dry. I, um, I really like in watercolor that mixture of um, soft and hard edges. I'm always going for contrast in my work, but I don't just mean value contrast, all kinds of contrast. So the vertical contrasted with the horizontal, the man-made contrasted with the natural, soft edges contrasted with, uh, with more defined, harder edges. All these different things going on in the work at the same time will lead, hopefully, to a far more interesting painting. So I'm using this sort of uh, barrel brush here. It's a line, type of a liner brush just on its edge for my trees. It's just something I like to do. Um, I'm sure we all have our own techniques for uh, how we like to paint trees. Not really suggestions as I'm not really teaching, but my my approach to painting trees is that if you draw them too much, in fact, if you draw your base drawing for your watercolors too 
distinctly, you tend to paint more slowly, more methodically, and you're a little bit more careful than you might want to be. So the painting can end up looking a little stiffer and more dry than it needs to. So uh, this drawing that I did on the watercolor paper is a little darker, a little more probably fleshed out than I would normally do, but I was just trying to be sure that it would show up on camera. Um, but in any case, especially with uh, objects like clouds or trees that are very organic and uh, have their own personalities, overdrawing on the watercolor paper first is generally speaking, a bad idea, I think. It's better to just let your, your brush as much as you can um, draw it for you, if you will, define it for you just intuitively. You find after you paint a long time, you learn a little bit better. It's a constant battle for me, but to listen to your painting. Um, as the painting progresses. It's okay, I think, to have a plan where you want the painting to go, but it's just as important to be able to let that plan go when things don't go as you've planned, because they won't, and to uh, sort of uh, let the painting tell you what it wants as you're doing it, and it will do that. It knows more about what it needs than, than you probably think. Um, what I'm doing here for the foliage is something I almost always do too in painting trees is I'll paint the areas of leaves first uh, while they're still quite wet. Then I'll drag in the uh, branches and trunks of the tree to allow them to bleed together. Another level of connection that I'm always going for. This big, dark, reversed C shape is compositionally very important because it hugs the light I'm most trying to save in here. So I'm weighting almost everything to the right side, which in this case means that the areas of leaves, the trunk of the tree, which you'll see in a minute, will have uh, more color, more, more saturation, more value, than anything happening on uh, the left side. I want the left side of the painting to be a little lighter, a little more impressionistic, and all of the harder edges, the more saturated values and colors will happen more in this curvilinear band, if that makes sense. So for the most part, that's, I may add some more later, but those are the, the main tree foliage shapes established. I'm now going to come in again as this is still wet and do uh, trunks and branches. Uh, I like before that dries too much to soften just a little about what's going on on this far side. Again to keep the contrast with harder edges on that side, softer here, more saturation there, a little less over here. I don't need to go too far, but that's, generally speaking, I think that's the way to go with this painting. So for the branch color, it doesn't much matter. It's more about uh, an issue of value than it is about color, but I'm gonna use a deep warm, a, a uh, Van Dyke brown, very little water, so it's fairly opaque. So it's a deep, warm color, which I think will be a nice complement to the, uh, the deep greens and the more olive green I used for the trees themselves, for the tree foliage. Ah, painting trees, I love it. I will say, if I give any advice, I'd say uh, the quicker, almost always the quicker you can paint a tree the better it's gonna look. I know for me, when I slow down and start to think and uh, try to be too careful, it almost never pans out for me. So for these big, thicker trunks, I'm using a smaller flat brush and sort of a dry brush 
way. There's a few of these skip marks. I think that's, that's really all to the good. It just uh, makes the tree feel a lot more organic and uh, a little less planned. I did plan this tree a little bit more than I might normally because it's such a focal point of the painting. It's such a focal element, I mean. But uh, the leaves areas I do want nice and organic. For branches, again, even more so, the quicker you can do them, the better. If you try to not think, you're gonna be better off and just uh, let the painting tell you what it needs and be uh, fairly uh, calligraphic. Make the branches like calligraphy. For now, I'm using the side of this little flat brush, but as they go further out into space, I'll swap out to a small round to do uh, the smaller branches. It's the same uh, burnt umber mix, but I worked in just a little bit of raw umber to lighten it up a little to keep, a, to keep these branches on this far side of the painting a little less saturated than the ones on the other side. And since I missed it this side, it's all gotten a little fuzzy and that's okay. That's too dark, but not to worry. And I noticed I'm starting to get a, a funky shape here. I don't think that's anything to worry about. It's still quite wet, so I can feather that out a little. I just really want to maintain as much light in this band as I, I can until further on. You can always take light away in a painting, but it's pretty hard to reclaim it or to add it back. I should say I'm not a purist, meaning I don't mind at all when people use little bits of opaque in their painting. I don't mind mixed media. I don't, I actually don't mind anything. Whatever works for you, do it. But for me, I love the challenge of trying to save uh, as much pure white in my painting as I can. It's just, uh, it's not a, a thing I think is right. I don't think there's anything right. I think it's only what works for you is what's right. I don't think there's any right way to do a watercolor painting or to do really anything else in this world. There's the way that works for you and there's the way that maybe doesn't. And it can just be a personal preference. I, uh, I come from a background of uh, commercial illustration, architecture, and anyway, a very sort of detail-oriented professions. So uh, I have had sort of my fill for now of doing very overly detailed work, and I like the challenge of doing more intuitive looser sketch work. So that sort of informs the way I want to paint. It doesn't make that way right or anybody else is wrong. It just, it's just what suits me right now at this point in my life and career. And I talk a lot about that with my, my painting groups. I think um, we're all a collection of our own experiences. We can only do what works right for us and again, nothing is right or wrong. It's only right or wrong for you. You may think I'm being a little careful about this tree. I am a little, only because it's such a big deal in the painting, but I think that's enough for now. I wanna get moving. Also, if you're clever, you've probably noticed what I'm also doing is waiting, killing time a bit up here to allow this area to dry enough. This is the focal point of my painting, meaning whatever really hard edges and crisp uh, 
tiny bit of detail I do want in the painting are going to happen just here. So I need uh, the background to be dry enough for, uh, for that to work. And I think we're in good shape, so I'm going to push ahead. I'll start in with these people. A couple of things I can say about painting uh, the human figure in a watercolor. Uh, I guess in general, I'd say it's a good rule of thumb to consider what kind of painting you're doing and then make everything in that painting belong there. So what I mean by that is if you're doing a sketch-based, quick, quicker, more intuitive-based painting, such as this, then I think even the most detailed, such as they are, things in that painting ought to look like they belong in that painting. So it would be wrong of me to go too tight, too detailed, too specific on any one thing in the painting. Uh, it could be wrong of me to do that because they would look like they wandered in from a different painting. They wouldn't look at home. If I were doing a, you know, a very studied, considered studio piece, then, uh, then I might get away with uh, certain bits of the painting that are, that are more detailed and more specific. But back to the human figure, I think if you draw a, a person in a sketch-based painting where you have a reasonable shaped head and a reasonable shaped shoulder, don't forget the neck, the rest of the body can almost just hang off of that without much detail at all. And a couple of strokes of the brush is usually enough to tell the story. And you don't need much more than that. In fact, it would be wrong to do much more than that, or wrong is the wrong word. It would be, uh, it would make that figure look not at home or overly detailed for the kind of work I'm doing. Another little tip I wanted to mention is if you're doing a backlit, a shadowy or dark figure, but you don't want it to just look dark and gloomy, uh, you want some color, you can start the figure on the edges with this really deep, what I'm using is just out of the tube neutral tint, just to go really dark, really quick. And then while it's still wet, drop in some very thick, very little water color, if you like, to Im imply the color of clothing without having to be specific in painting and little stripes on the guy's shirt or jacket. And his friend here, she can have a red uh, top on and you don't have to be very careful. You can just drop some color in and uh, it tells the story without having to be too overly specific. And that's really what I want. Again, my background is in uh, very detailed work. So it's been my holy grail as I go forward to uh, swim upstream a bit against that and try to make my current work more expressive, less explanatory. I think that's the difference. My older work was very explanatory. It explained my subjects, but it didn't uh, express them very well. So I, uh, that's my goal with my new work to be less explanatory, more expressive. And this woman is sitting on a, a um, porch swing that they've tied up to the tree, or I've decided that's what they've done. So I'm just trying to tell that story. Again, I don't wanna to get too, too detailed. I want it to look shadowy and a little mysterious. Um, Another thing I've learned along the road uh, for me is um, your paintings can often involve the viewer or excite the viewer a lot more when you don't explain everything, when you don't paint every little detail. It doesn't always make the painting better to add more. It often makes the painting better when you add less. When you paint just enough 
that uh, there's a little sense of mystery and the viewer of your work looks at it and tries to unsolve the puzzle and tries to figure out what's going on. And the next thing you know, they want to buy it. And what could be better than that? Well, hopefully so. So what I'm saying is really um, tell just enough. Just imply. Don't state. Interpret. Don't explain. For me, that's my goal in my painting. So for the dock work here, it's a... Uh, well, I'm making it all up, but what I want it to look like and feel like is this rough hewn logs and boards, not very, not fine woodworking by any means, but just a very humble um, down home, informal kind of a look. So there's some pilings sticking up out of the water, the boards of the dock, um, very informal, so uh, I want to paint them in that way. So I'm using this mid-sized flat brush with very little water to just imply the shapes on the dock. A lot of these skip marks are fine. I think they're good, in fact. They help, uh, they help get the story across. I'm trying to make it look almost like an abstract collection of, of shapes so the viewer has to look and say, what the heck's going on there? And bit by bit, they'll they figure it out. Viewers are smart. They can fill in a lot of the blanks. You don't have to tell them everything. Better when you don't. Okay, um, again, before any of that really dries, I wanna keep going and then finish off the bottom of the painting by um, adding the boats and then the reflections and a little bit of identity in the water. So while this is still wet, um, I'll start this boat. This boat is uh, facing in at the dock, but it's much more in shade, much more in the shadows. That is, this boat is picking up a little bit of light from the imagined sun behind the trees. So it can afford to be a little lighter and have a little bit more uh, color on it. This one's quite shady, shadowy, but I'm going to give it some, um, some color as well, but darker, shadowy color. I'm also going to be a little less careful about this boat. I just want it to look more like the idea of a boat as opposed to an actual boat. I think uh, you get the sense that it is a boat. I'm going to take some deep ultramarine blue, very little water against that neutral tint, and just on the back of the boat, drop in some of this pretty saturated deep blue tone with a flat brush, and let it just run up into the, uh, the other color. And what I think you can see is starting to happen too is that um, this blue and the blue on this figure begin to talk to each other and set up another connection, connecting one thing to another. Um, and then you can probably figure out, I'm probably gonna put some red on this boat to sort of set up another dialogue there. So you'll get these kind of interesting uh, diagonalities going on through your painting. Before this dries, I have to come right down into the water with some deep green and some violet and um, imply a reflection in the water. I don't want any line between boat and, and reflection. This is just a very, very deep green. I'm gonna bring it up into the boat. So uh, again, connections. The light here is very important. Light down here, I want a little, but not as much as shown, so I don't need to be careful too much about what's really there. I just need to knock back some of that light, saving a few sparkles. But to play up this big C-shape composition, 
this whole side of the painting needs to have a bit more weight to it. So I can do that just with a flat brush and um, a few impressionistic marks. You're never too old to learn new tricks. I never ever used flat brushes, oddly enough, until a couple of years ago. I was given some as a gift um, on a trip to China, and uh, I was grateful, but I thought, I'll never use these. I never painted with flat brushes, but sure enough, I just started to play around with them, and I realized what I'd been missing. They're, uh, <laughs> they're an invaluable part of the way I, I paint now. What they, what they give me, um, the, the dry brush work is one thing, but they give me just another expression, which is a contrast. Um, I, I know painters that do whole paintings all in flat brush and they're beautiful. Um, I, I don't do that too much, but what I try to do is mix in a um, sort of a choreography, a mixture of different brush types brushwork types within the same painting. So some round brushwork mixed with some flat brushwork. If you orchestrate that nicely, it can be a really nice sort of um, dialogue within your work. The left side of this boat, of course, really needs to anchor this big, deep, intricate shape I'm making. So I'm being a little careful this is right out of the tube, neutral tint, very dark, obviously. I'm just being graphic about that shape of the back of the boat. Not especially careful, but I want it to look pretty dark. This is a tiny little sailboat dinghy, I'm imagining. And um, again, it's not a matter of making it look accurate. It's a matter of making a compelling shape to uh, orchestrate all these other shapes within the painting. There's a mast that goes up here and I want it to vanish up into the trees. This is just another uh, connector, if you will, a way to connect the man-made world to the organic. Not bad. Now, as I said, I want to work uh, just on the top of the boat. You just see a little of it. A little bit of warm, reddish color to, um, well, to complement the greens, but also to set up this little dialogue with uh, the seated female figure there. So this is just really fairly opaque uh, cad orange with the uh, whatever's in my palette. I think there's a little uh, burnt sienna there. Doesn't much matter. Warm is what I'm thinking. I am probably far more a valuist painter than I am a, uh, a colorist. I like color, we all do. But I really don't think any color, however beautiful it may be, can save a work where the values aren't, aren't happening correctly. So I try my best not to think too much about the color I'm using, more about the temperature, whether it's warm or cool, and more so about whether it's light or dark. Same as I did there, I'm gonna bring this boat down and then it's gonna become its own reflection. So I'll swap out to some of this really deep green. And uh, you could say, wouldn't the reddish boat be reflecting red? Yeah, it would. And hopefully that's wet enough still where some of that, that saturated, very wet wash of red will run down into the reflection and sort of paint itself. And yeah, yes, it is. I could encourage it a little bit, if I wish, to do that a bit more. But I don't wanna to get too fussy about it. Just to set up that connection. 
I need a base along the painting before it dries, obviously. But what I'm going to do first, uh, I've got to work quite quickly, but I want to add just some grayed out teal identity to the water in the canal way behind. A couple of uh, tools as watercolorists we have at our disposal that don't yet cost any money. But gravity, I work quite wet and usually and uh, always at an angle. Don't be afraid to turn your, to tip your board up down or upside down, however it works best for you to uh, encourage your washes to run the way you want. So you, you can add some directionality to water or to a sky or to tree areas or whatever you're painting, but also uh, you can encourage the paint to run faster at a steeper angle or less fast, obviously, at a shallower angle. But anyway, gravity, yeah, I, I'm always a little amazed at how many painters work with their board just flat on, the, on their table or easel, and uh, I just think you're missing out on the opportunity to allow gravity to do half of your work for you. The other free tool we have that they haven't charged us for yet is your finger. So if you want to soften an edge here or there or take a little out, don't be afraid. Your painting can take it. What I'm trying to do here now is just not a lot, but I'm trying to add a little identity to the water. And a little more color as it comes forward. So um, often watercolor images of, of bodies of water to me, even if they're well painted, can tend to look a little flat if the artist hasn't modulated the values of that body of water. Meaning, it should look lighter either farther away or closer up, but it should look darker on one edge of the plane than the other. So what I'm going for is quite light here, obviously, and much darker here. So hopefully that body of water will appear more horizontal and look flat and not just like a decorated vertical surface. So that's some um, grayed out teal that became a little more teal. And now here I'm gonna start working in some of that really deep green. finish it off with a little bit more of the um, ultra blue violet mix at the very bottom. Just allowing everything to run together. Don't be afraid to paint upward. It's a nice and very simple way to add a little tone, texture, and value areas of your painting that may need it. I use it often in water to something like this to imply a very easy way to imply some reflectivity. And also as it dries it's a good way to add a little texture if uh, anything needs it. Um, so Pretty nearly done. The main elements are there. My lightest light has been saved. My mid-tones are established. Foregr uh, background, foreground, and much of my darkest darks are in. This large foreground element that's a hopefully nice and interesting collection of man-made elements and natural elements. The tree talking to the sky, reflecting in the water, connected to the dock, to the people, and to the boats and their reflections. 
Um, as this dries, you can become a little smaller and a little more detailed if you want. You can add some, some rigging here and there to the boats. It is a sketch painting, so a little of this kind of thing, I think, will go a long way. You don't need a lot, but it just adds maybe another level of uh, interest or texture. If you're going to do this kind of thing, it's probably best to be pretty impressionistic about it, not too specific. I don't want this poor woman to be suspended in midair, so I will tie her porch swing down to the tree with some chains or wires. She'll be happier. So in terms of designing my work, what I always try to do, again, this is not a rule, it's just one rule of thumb that works for me. I encourage everybody to think up their own design hierarchy. By that, I mean what's most important in your painting and what isn't. I think in life, uh, design is the, is the act of choice, meaning, what do you choose to leave in? What do you choose to leave out? If you're a baker, you know you can't put every ingredient in every pie or cake you're making. It wouldn't taste right. The same thing with a painting. Um, when you decide what kind of painting you're doing, that begins to tell you a lot. It begins to tell you what the format is. Do you want to do a horizontal? Do you want to do a vertical? It begins to tell you what the composition of shapes, therefore, might be. Um, so for me, we're running out of time here, but my hierarchy of important design elements is in four components. The most important, number one, is what is your intent? What's the story you want your painting to tell? Why are you doing this painting in the first place? as opposed to just sitting on the beach or something. That tells you a lot. There's something in you that inspires you to paint this, as opposed to painting something else. What is that? You know, there isn't any one right answer, and I can't tell you what your answers would be. That's the very personal choice. That's the stuff of art. That's what makes you the artist you are, and, and me, my own unique type of artist. We're not all alike. We're similar, no doubt, but we all have our own personal impulses. So what is your intent? Once you know that, then I think you should ask yourself, okay, how do I compose that intent into a painting? That's why my sketches are so helpful to me. They help me arrange the shapes of my ideas into potential paintings. Once you know your composition, more or less, or you have a pretty good idea what it might be, then you can begin to think about the values. How deep of a range of values do you want? How wide a range of values do you need? And then last but not least, color. Which colors help me tell my story? Again, I love color, we all do. But for me, color is the last on my list of important design elements. The color has to be in service to your value design. Your value design needs to be in service to your overall composition. And your overall composition needs to be in service to the idea, to the intent of the painting. Here in the wet water, I'm just adding a little bit of um, detail, but it's just um, a few water identity marks here to add a little bit more shade and shadow and a little bit more of a sense of the horizontal plane. And here just to uh, anchor the boat down and to make it look a little bit more in the, in the foreground. So I think my time is about up. I don't think this painting needs a lot more. It's meant to be an impressionistic 
quick exercise and uh, the major elements are all there. I do wanna thank uh, Anna again and everybody at Fabriano for making all this happen and putting it together. And I most especially wanna thank you all for, uh, for joining me and spending this hour with me. I really look forward to the day I can see you all again in person down the road. So be safe, take care of yourself, take care of each other, and uh, be well. Talk to you all soon.